What is going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sean Noriega, welcome back to the channel and before we get into the video, I want to say that this video is sponsored by Jack Factory. If you have any protein, creatine, pre-workout or focus enhancing supplement needs, use code NORI at checkout on jackfactory.com for 20% off. In fact, while we were down in Daytona, we actually filmed a really cool promo and Q&A, me, Jesus, Johnny Candido, all for Jack Factory, which will be available for you guys to watch very soon. Now, let's get into the video, which is a topic that I've highly anticipated uh, making for you guys, as well as I'm sure many of you have been interested in hearing about, which is my recap of Raw Nationals. Um, now, before I even get into the story, I would just like to say, you know, thank you guys so much um, for all of the support. Um, I've received, I think, more like backing and support throughout this prep than probably any other point in my powerlifting career, and, and I really, I'm just unbelievably thankful for that. Um, my feelings about what happened are, I'm angry. I'm, I'm really, really mad. I think I've been just, just feeling angry every day uh, since I've competed. Um, I feel like I let a really great opportunity go by. Um, I feel like I let myself down, I feel like I let my coach down, I feel like I let you guys down, um, and it sucks. So before I talk about the specifics, the simple thing is that I got hurt um, while competing. Now I want to preface everything that I say with this one statement, which is that um, getting hurt or not showing up healthy to a meet is part of showing up. Right? There's no, if you were healthy, you could have done this. There's no, well, he was injured. Being healthy, and I need to clarify this because people on social media love to think I'm throwing excuses. Being healthy is part of showing up. In any sport, it doesn't matter when you know Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl and you say, oh, well, whoever was hurt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you show up, you have to be healthy. That's part of it. Right? That's, that's literally part of performing. So while I had the best prep that I could have asked for. While I do believe that if I were healthy, the opportunity was there to lift X, Y, and Z, I cannot say that if I were healthy, I would have done this, this, and this. In the same way that you can't say that training is going to predict you know, what you do on meet day, I can't in hindsight say, well, if I were healthy, I would have done this. So, wanted to get that out of the way because I 100% acknowledge that even if I were healthy, still had to perform. So, what happened? Well, this was an injury that I had dealt with during the Texas prep. So, I hurt my hamstring. Um, I have not had an MRI yet, okay? I'm going to get one when I'm back in New York. I'm currently in Miami. Um, I'm going to get an MRI, so I know just what to tackle um, more specifically, but basically, the semimembranosis and maybe a little bit of the adductor area, like right in the muscle belly is what got aggravated. So it wasn't at, at an insertion point, it wasn't a tendon rupture or anything like that. Um, what I felt on meet day, and this is just what I felt, is what started off as just like a, a sharp pain during the descent and bottom portion of the squat started to feel like fabric just ripping. Like it just felt like if you had like the you know, the fabric of a t-shirt, the threads of it, it just felt like it was shearing um, as I was squatting. I felt it in the warm-up room really badly, and I was hoping that as we went along, things would get better. Um, it didn't, and then obviously when I, you know, when I actually was on the platform taking attempts, it was way worse. So, this was a hamstring injury that I dealt with during my prep for the Texas meet. Um, Steve and I were originally on a two-day low bar, one-day high bar split, and realized that the high bar day wasn't really progressing. Things were kind of flatlining after the initial adaptation. So we upped it to three days. And it's pretty clear for me at this point that three days of comp squatting is necessary to progress. Um, and it doesn't feel from a fatigue management or soreness or overwork standpoint that it is too much. I don't feel like the typical signs of fatigue, performance doesn't necessarily dip um, when squatting three days a week. However, it's pretty evident that something gives, right, when it comes to my tissue, right? Like there's an area of my body that is clearly accumulating more stress than it should be, and it's 
accumulating it in a much more uh, just overwhelmingly allocated to that area away um, than other parts of my body. So it's it's this medial hamstring, you know, semimembranosus area that got aggravated. Now during that prep, it got aggravated. Um, we dialed back and it happened at like two weeks out. So we essentially like tapered before the actual taper was supposed to happen. So squats on me they didn't wow. feel that great um, during that prep, but things subsided. Then coming into this meet, um, we had done three days a week of squatting and right around the three week out mark, actually on my birthday, I'll show my close friend story right here because I posted it on my birthday that the pre-nationals uh, injury curse stays loyal. Now, I've just been uh, in a situation many years where I've gotten hurt very, very close to nationals, like four weeks, five weeks, three weeks out, like every, every nationals I've done, that has happened. Um, and I was able to keep it at bay. You know, I had one session of not really being able to squat. Um, one of my friends was a PT, Ben, uh, or sorry, John Song, um, really, really helped me at the gym. Um, he's, you know, one of our members at United, who's also a PT, helped me go from not being able to squat, you know, 150 kilos to being able to squat like 220 kilos the next session. So it was worse this prep than it was the previous one, but after the consultations with John, things started to get significantly better and I pretty much made it the whole way of the prep. Um, and then on meet day, the pain just kind of resurfaced. I don't know if it was just because of the amount of rest that I had, like I went from like, you know, not squatting for a couple days to, um, you know, having to lift heavy weight again. I don't know if maybe I trained like more thoroughly through prep or through the end of prep if things would have, you know, been better. I don't know. Um, but it was hurting really badly. I took like 600 milligrams of ibuprofen just to like see if it would, you know, subside. It didn't. So going back in, in the story to what happened on squats is uh, it hurt really badly on the opening squat. The second squat, it really felt like fabric was tearing and that's, you know, kind of why I just bottomed out. Um, and then the third attempt, I was able to come back. I used a belt that was tighter just to see if I could like, it would help me cut depth a little bit so it wouldn't be as painful. I ended up getting it, but obviously nowhere near where I wanted to finish on squat. Now, going into deadlift, there was one session, like that first one where I mentioned I couldn't squat 150 kilos where deadlifts also hurt, but the rest of the prep, it didn't really bug me too much. Um, but on deadlifts, it really, really hurt. Um, I came into deadlifts, Try pulling one red, and the first attempt at pulling one red, I couldn't pull it. Like, it was just like a very sharp, like kind of snappy pain. Um, and it just caught me off guard because I'm thinking like, okay, this is gonna be super casual, whatever. Um, and my coach, Steve DeNovi, was like, are you good? Like, are you gonna be able to keep going? I could see the you know, disappointment on his face that I was in pain. Um, and I said, yeah, of course. Like I was in a situation where I knew squat didn't go well, my new bench didn't go well, which I'll get to, but, Deadlift always shows up on meet day, and I knew that I was gonna feel super strong. I had a chance to PR my total, PR my deadlift, and, and potentially take second place. So I was like, yeah, of course, I'm gonna keep going. So I work up to two reds, that also hurts. Um, I started my deadlift warm ups earlier because I knew that if I was gonna be in pain, I needed time to like, you know, either figure out a different way to pull or change openers, whatever, right? I couldn't be in a situation because I usually am at the end of a flight. I couldn't be in a situation where a last warm up moved poorly and then I'm not able to change my order. So I'm working my way up. I started deadlift attempts or warm ups early. Um, and then I get it to 220 kilos. Uh, the first time I go to pull it, I break the floor. I feel really bad. Same kind of fabric tearing feeling. Um, I was like, okay, we'll try it again like the other ones because every warm up before that I had to essentially try to pull twice. Um, I tried a second time, no dice. Tried a third time, no dice. Um, I wanted to try it a fourth time, honestly. Like I, I was just very frustrated and I knew that, you know, I had an opportunity to pull big if I could just pull, right? So I keep trying to pull it. Steve is like, like, what are you doing? Like if, if you're in if you're in too much pain to pull 220, uh, you're not gonna pull a PR on the platform. It's like let's just ride in the token pull. Um, and I was pissed. Like I was as, in, as I'm sure many of you would be as well. Like I was mentally ready despite 
you know, what happened earlier on in the meet to pull. I tried to. If Steve weren't there, I probably would have tried to keep going. Um, but Steve has been like a very, very strong voice of reason for me. Like any time where I say something that I, I think is right in maybe a slightly emotional situation, he's very firm in not entertaining that. So after I missed 220 kilos three times, you know, I was willing to be like, okay, you're, you're probably right. It's not worth getting injured even further, you know, potentially worsening this already existing injury any further. So we ended up taking um, a 75 kilo, you know, token deadlift, just getting in, getting out, registering a total out of respect for the competition. I think not finishing a meet, you know, at least in my opinion, it's just kind of, um, I don't know how else to put it, just kind of like disrespectful to the, to the competition. Um, so yeah, I, I finished the meet, the token deadlift. I ended up uh, totaling a whopping 565 kilos and uh, placed last. So um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was an unfortunate uh, day. Obviously very upsetting for me, upsetting for a lot of people who, who wanted to see me perform. And I, and I obviously feel like I owe you guys, those of you who do, um, you know, believe in me and have supported me through all of this. Um, so the, the thing is that there are things that are out of your control within reason, but you know, you reflect on this experience and you think, okay, I, I'm very much a person, person of, of taking over ownership of, of a lot of things. I believe that a lot of consequences are a result of your actions in one way or another. Um, and while there are some things that can be more out of your control than others, nothing is ever entirely out of your control. So, with what happened with my hamstring, how can I take this situation as a learning lesson going forward? Well, there, there are two things that stuck out to me, which is one, um, how I treat nationals prep versus other preps, okay? I have always treated nationals like it was like, bigger than any other meat, which it is, but what happened, and what happens, is that I let it make me think that I need to do more, okay? Um, one of the things that Steve and I discussed is that when we started working together, I was very conservative and kept a logical pace of progression from week to week, um, and left a lot in the tank, right? Just letting the program do its job, not necessarily forcing anything. And I even did a good job of that during the, the Texas prep, but Nationals came along and I think I got a little bit outside of myself and, and tried to do too much, okay? And with the program on paper, you look at it and say, okay, this should be feasible, but if I'm taking primary, or sorry, secondary and tertiary days and having the mindset going in that it needs to be almost as good as a primary day, and I'm getting you know super hyped up for days that maybe don't necessarily need that, and I'm just trying to empty the tank all the time and expecting you know, to hit these big numbers because it's nationals, that can accumulate undue stress, okay? I think that going forward, if I were to continue squatting the way that I was and just kind of were more conservative with it, maybe I beat out you know, any, any chance of an injury, right? Maybe I make it to the meet without an injury. But when I have this mindset of being overly aggressive, foot on the gas 24-7, um, it can potentially it can potentially lead to that, okay? So that is a, a mistake that I've made that I think I need to do a better job of controlling going forward. And I think it was especially strong this year because of how strong I felt. I really felt like I was in control, felt like I was in a good spot. So it, it's, it was easy to, to try to like ride a high every day. So that's something that I need to change. Um, the second thing is my squat stance. Now, this is something that I've run with for a very, very long time. Um, I used to squat very narrow, actually, up until about 20, like late 2016, early 2017, um, was when I really started to move my stance out. It was originally because of pain I was experiencing. Um, now, obviously, my squat stance as it has become is very wide, um, and potentially could be a cause of that undue stress at the adductor, and, and, and through like moving around this past week, trying to figure out what hurts and what doesn't. Like, I can't squat that wide. Like, just even body weight, I feel it. Um, and I think I hung on to that squat stance because of how successful it was for me in that late 2019, early 2019, late 2018, 
early 2019 era where I was squatting 650, 660, squatting 606 for four, 584 for seven, like all these massive numbers. And I think I clung to that because I was able to squat all that weight when I was in that same stance. But obviously my squat has been at best 295 in the gym, at best 290 in a meet. Um, I'm not, I'm not that same squatter anymore, right? Like I can't cling to that. So I think that for efficiency's sake, for sustainability's sake, it makes sense for me to go back to a more narrow squat stance. Um, I'll be doing so in heels because um, I just don't have the hip flexion capabilities to squat super narrow and not fold. Um, so that's going to be a secondary change for me and, it's, and I'm excited to do it. Um, I think in the long run, maybe even in the slight, you know, kind of short term, I'll probably match um, what I've been squatting wider. But this is a change I need to make. Again, like I said, I think out of being stubborn and, and kind of nostalgic, holding on to what I used to be able to do with a given stance, um, I think I need to relinquish that, um, kind of let the ego go, and just and just do what makes the most sense going forward. So that's the plan there. Um, so yeah, I just I wanted to talk about like what, how I felt I'm responsible for the outcome, which I most certainly am. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about what the plan was. Not to say again, not to say that I'm, I was guaranteed to hit any of these numbers. I'm just going to talk about what training indicated and what the plan was. So Steve and I discussed going into the meet for months that 850, 850 kilos was going to be the number to beat. Um, and what ended up, ended up happening on meet day was the winner, Russ, totaled 843 and went for 850.5 and missed. So Steve was right on the money with what was needed in order to win. Um, my best training lifts were a 290 squat, a 235 kilo bench, and a 335 kilo deadlift, um, which is an 860 uh, training total. Now, the plan for squats was to go um, 265 kilos, 280 kilos, 290 kilos. The plan on deadlift was to go 300, 320, and then pull whatever was needed. Um, just based on the, the rep PRs that I hit in training and some of the singles. Um, for example, like I, I doubled uh, 320 kilos at one point during the prep, or rather the block prior to the prep. Um, we felt confident that we would be pulling uh, second to Angelo. That was, that was a, a point of confidence that we had coming into this meet. Um, with regards to bench press, of course, I did all my training on a fat pad, and that wasn't out of clout, that wasn't out of you know, denial or any, anything. It's the simple fact that there was no way for me to accumulate as much volume as I needed to progress training on like the crappy TSS pads that we have at United. It was just impossible. Um, so that was what we needed. In addition, we knew what the drop-off was going to be from a fat pad to an ER, to a Texas, whatever, because we knew what existed. And if you look back to my um, Texas meat prep, the heaviest single I took during meat prep was 220 kilos, and I just narrowly missed 218 kilos on meat day. Just clipped the rack and missed it. Um, so to think that I got 15 kilos stronger and could only bench 210 on strength, and, and I had people commenting, you know, oh, like the ER rack should have been training on it, like it clearly fucked you up, like, you know, that's why you shouldn't train on a fat pad. Um, that's not what happened. <laughs> the, the ER felt fantastic, um, surprisingly. I was, I was very happy with how it felt, um, and in the warm up room, everything was flying, felt great. So, this is another point I'm going to clarify at the end of this that I'm not making any sort of excuse here, and you'll understand why. Um, but the carpet at Nationals was horrible, absolutely horrible. I will show videos right now of people slipping uh, on this thing. This was used at the Arnold last year, and I think a bunch of people had a problem with it. Um, and it's never been used before, like just you just use regular carpet and it works fantastically. So this material, I don't know what it was, it was like, it was carpet, but like had like straight lines on it instead of like that like knitted kind of feel that you can grip to. It almost felt like it had like a plastic coating on it. Anyway, I was slipping horrendously. Um, as many of you know, 
my bench press relies heavily on a very forward foot position for the sake of leg drive. Um, I couldn't get any. And like when I say none, I mean literally none. Like I would put my feet down in front of me and they would literally just slide. It was like an ice rink. Um, so what I ended up having to do was just tuck my feet back and just plant them there. Like I couldn't even push. I just had to plant my feet down and just essentially just use my body like you know a normal bench press. Um, but yeah, I literally just had to press, no leg drive, just have my feet under me where they wouldn't slip, um, but obviously was not able to push through them. So, finished with 210 kilos. The plan was to go 205, 215 and a half to chip my own record, and then go 223 to 225. And I'm very confident that the strength was there for that. I won't say that I would have hit it, because again, you can't predict, but I'm confident that the strength was there for that. Um, but obviously the circumstances dictated otherwise. Now, everyone has to deal with the same carpet, okay? Everybody does. And the advantage that I confer from benching the way that I do and creating that arch is also subject to, you know, falling apart when the environment doesn't cater itself to that, right? So that's, an, that's a, a loss that I have to incur, right? It's not, while I do believe that the USAPL should never use this carpet again, and I know many other people who have already issued complaints to people who are you know, involved with running these meets about that carpet, it was used. It was used and everybody had to deal with it, right? So the same way that I get an advantage from benching the way that I do over other people, I have to just eat whatever disadvantage comes with you know, a shitty uh, environment, okay? So that is something that I, I fully accept. So. What would be the solution here, right? Let's say the USAPL decides to use this carpet forever. Well, guess what, Sean? You have no other option but to adapt. So if the USAPL were to say, fuck it, we want to use this crappy black carpet forever because it has our USAPL logo on it, we're never going to use regular carpet again, I would have to learn to bench with my feet way under me. It sucks. It would be, you know, obviously inhibitory for probably a while until I get the hang of it. Um, but I would have no other option. I have to compete. These are the circumstances. It would be like in baseball if a ground ball were hit on a field and like there was a bad hop and the ball went past the guy and run scored. It's like, sorry dude, that's just, just the name of the game. So that's something I, I fully accept. Um, again, you know, you are not entitled to your training numbers. You're not. You know, whether you got hurt, whether you got a bad call, whether the carpet was slippery, you're not entitled to your training numbers. I 100% felt like I had the opportunity to come in and win, um, but that's not the way, you know, that's not the way the, the, the cards were dealt, right? And, and there are many things that I could have done um, to open myself up to that opportunity better that I didn't, right? We already covered it. It's, you know, the way that I was squatting probably is not sustainable for the long term, and I chose to ignore that. Um, the way that I came into training sessions perhaps just led me to fizzle out a bit too early. Um, the way that I bench is a liability. You know, if, if I don't have the perfect conditions, then, then I'm subject to losing kilos. Um, so yeah, the plan now is to just, just rehab this hamstring. Um, I'm not worried about rehabbing. Um, I've never been. I've always had fantastic resources. Um, you know, everyone that I've you know encountered in the like movement and, and powerlifting space has been uh, you know very very knowledgeable. I myself have you know I like to believe a lot of tools to handle this myself as well. Um, but yeah, the plan is to just get healthy, and I just wanted to give all of you a recap on on what had happened. So. I'll probably be competing again sometime in the winter. I don't know when yet. Obviously, the primary goal is to make sure that I can just lift pain-free. But that's the story, guys. And um, I really appreciate all the support that I've gotten. I appreciate all of you watching this. Um, and I promise to give you guys the performance that you know I know that I can deliver, that the performance that you guys deserve to see. Um, so we're just going to keep working, and that's the way it always is. Um, you know, it's it was a bad day, but I really do believe no bad days, only data. Because what I learned from this meet potentially has changed the trajectory of my entire powerlifting career. Like, I don't think if this meet didn't happen, I would have ever felt like, okay, yeah, you gotta learn to squat differently. Like, it just has to happen. So, I, I truly do take away those lessons, and I, and I invite all of you, in whenever you experience anything like this, to try to find those lessons amidst all that madness and, and shit. Um, 
So yeah, that's it for the video, guys. Uh, before I go, I would like to show you uh, some of the new t-shirts. This is one of them. I'll be showing you guys some of the newer ones um, that are coming. But this is the uh, Resilience tee. See if you guys can see the back as well. Um, obviously, there's a samurai on there. These will be releasing very, very soon. Um, they'll be on the TeamNori.com website. Uh, release date will be coming very soon. And once I have every bit of apparel in hand, we should be getting this launch going. So, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe. Remember, there are no bad days, and I will see you guys in the next video.